Well, welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Karen Corman and I have the privilege of being the Executive Director of the UIC Alumni Association. Welcome to the UIC Alumni Exchange Series. Each week we work to bring you a variety of programs and topics so you can explore, connect, and even escape from the everyday with a community of UIC alumni, faculty, and staff experts. You'll hear me say this a few times today, but I encourage you to visit go.uic.edu backslash alumni exchange for the latest and greatest programming. And with that, I am excited to start our program this afternoon featuring four UIC College of Business alumni who have built their careers in the food and beverage industry. I did see and wanted to extend a special welcome to the Dean of the College of Business, Michael McHale, who is joining us today. Thank you, Dean McHale, for being here. Today, our alumni panelists will talk us through how the industry is changing, what and where we are eating and drinking, and make some predictions of where the industry is going for the future. We hope that you brought your lunch for this interactive panel. But before we get started, we have two polls. So if you quickly tell us who you are that's joining us today, and let us know if you're a student or a faculty or a member of our staff at UIC, if you're a graduate, if you're a friend of UIC, Give it just a few seconds for the, for the poll to go. Always helps to see where people are calling in from and also love and thank you for putting in chat the where you're calling in from. That's always fantastic to see. I have a very high alumni population, which is wonderful since it's called the UIC Alumni Exchange. Okay, great. So 75% of our audience is alumni, wonderful. Our second poll, and you can select more than one, uh, more than one answer here is, um, what brings you to this webinar today? Do you work in the food and beverage industry? Are you a self-proclaimed foodie? I am not, I'm just reading the answers. Are you concerned about how the industry has changed because of COVID-19? Or are you simply just hungry and thought that this could add to your lunchtime or snack time uh, program today? And again, you can select more than one and there's no judgment. <laughs> okay, we have a nice split going. Wonderful. So the predominant one is that there's concern about how the industry is changing uh, because of COVID-19. Thank you so much for taking the polls. We really appreciate giving some context to our audience, to our panelists. Thank you to each of our panelists for being here today. And to start the program, I'm going to turn it over to David Hankus, a 1996 graduate who works as an advisory group senior principal at Technomic. Welcome, David. Thank you so much for being here. Great. Thanks, Karen. And I appreciate it. Uh, I am going to put up my screen here to uh, do a couple of slides here. Hopefully you guys can see it. I think you can. Correct. Um, great. So I guess just, just by way of introduction and, and Karen sort of mentioned it, I've, uh, I'm a 96 uh, a UIC MBA grad. I started at Technomic right out of grad school. And so I've been working at Technomic for over 24 years now. Uh, before that, I had a long line of food industry experience from McDonald's in high school to working for Marriott in college, did an internship at Nestle Germany. Uh, the firm itself, if you haven't heard of Technomic and you do work in the food industry, we've been around uh, since 1966. And we're essentially a research and consulting company that focuses primarily on food away from home or food service. Uh, but we do take a, a broader look at the food and beverage industries. And so I'm going to be moderating uh, the discussion today. But before we, I guess, get into it or in our time today, uh, I'm going to spend just a, about five minutes talking through uh, some big trends, some key trends. But really the, the heart of why you're all here and, and what I want to focus on today is, is the panel discussion. And so I'm pleased to be joined by three industry professionals that are, I'll introduce shortly. Um, but as I said, I wanted to, to start by sharing some technomic research and insights around uh, the topics that we're going to talk about today. Uh, and then I'll introduce the panel and open up our discussion. And so if you look at what, uh, what at least I have on tap, and again, you know, feel free to ask any questions. Uh, we're going to leave some time at the end uh, for, the, uh, for the audience to ask some additional questions. But you know, really, how has the food and beverage industry changed during COVID? We want to get into some sustainability issues. That's a, that's a big topic in the industry right now. Health and wellness, uh, this idea of convenience versus experiential. Uh, changing eating, eating patterns and the growth of new cuisine types, channel blurring, all of these things that 
are impacting you as consumers, right? Because at the end of the day, we're approaching this, whether we work in the industry or not, we're all consumers of the food and beverage industry, whether it's in restaurants or at the grocery store. Uh, and so I think the, the topics that we're going to be talking about have wide applicability to just about everyone. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to a, a, an interesting panel discussion with our, our three experts. So let's start first. Uh, I, I mentioned sustainability and broadly sustainability is a big topic that when we research it gets broken into three main components. And when you look at food and beverage companies, they're really working to align initiatives within each of these components. And so the planet, we, we see a lot of talk about reduction in greenhouse emissions, reducing carbon footprint, recycling, reusing, reducing food waste. Uh, from a people perspective, human rights, humane working conditions, living wage, gender equality, diversity, inclusion, uh, and certainly product sustainability, fair trade, ethical sourcing, plant-based ingredients, eco-friendly, biodegradable packaging. All of these uh, are hugely important to the food industry and we're gonna get into, and, and we're, we're fortunate that our panel has a wide array of experiences and we'll certainly talk more about that. And I think from a sustainability perspective, we're seeing the, the food and beverage industry really adapt from what was a linear economy to more of a circular economy, right? So uh, linear economies are uh, less and less viable and don't really meet the current definition of what sustainability is. So for example, consumers are holding brands responsible for what happens to packaging post-use. They want food and beverage companies to understand and plan the full life cycle impact of a product. And, and brands are responding, and we'll talk more about this during our panel. But I think that circular economy of, of you know, really you know, making and using and reusing things uh, is something that's important to consider. Uh, and I think part of that sustainability message as well focuses on, you know, as, as well as I, I guess a focus on health and wellness has been this whole plant-based innovation that we've seen. Last year and into May of this year, there's a huge increase in plant-based meat sales and grocery. You see there about 264%, certainly has continued through the pandemic. But I think it's important when you talk about plant-based innovation, it's not just food and whether it's, you know, beef, chicken, pork replacement, plant-based carbs, uh, plant-based seafood replacements, but even beverage, right? Oat milk and almond milk and, you know, different seed-based milks. And we're seeing some of this as well in beverage alcohol. And so this whole plant-based trend is something that I think, you know, partly wins on sustainability and, and certainly, you know, as a health and wellness focus to it as well. A second big trend that we're seeing is the tension among consumers and what they want and demand from the food industry. And so this is true not only for restaurants and food service, but I'd say for anywhere that consumers are sourcing or getting food and beverage. And here our research is a little bit more specific to restaurants, but I think it's fair to say that uh, when dining out, at least pre-pandemic, uh, dining out had turned into a form of entertainment. 67% of consumers said that visiting restaurants is a form of entertainment. And so really, you know, food as entertainment or as a recreation, I think is something that is very important. But at the same time, convenience is driving a huge increase in consumer visits. You know, pre-pandemic, 61% of, a, of a consumers in a survey that we did agreed that they'd be interested in grab and go tech-driven systems. And so we're starting to see how technology and the ability to get something on the go has been a huge driver for consumers. And, and so, you know, when you say, all right, well, that's, that's great, but what does it look like in practice? And I think Starbucks is a, is a great example. Most of you, you know, that are Chicago-based or that went to school here uh, may know Starbucks Reserve that uh, has just been open a short time. Uh, it's in the old Crate and Barrel building on, on the Mag Mile, but it's five stories, three coffee bars, a cocktail bar, food selections, coffees roasted on premise. And so they've really built a truly unique coffee experience. And that really speaks to that experiential part of the food and beverage industry that we're seeing, you know, getting something totally unique and different. At the same time, they've also gone in another direction with what they call Starbucks Now, which is a takeout and delivery focused location. And this one in particular is in New York. And so we see a lot of investment in improving that off-premise experience with uh, streamlined units uh, and with a focus on convenience. And so you can sort of view this on a grid where perceptually and positionally, the industry is going in two directions, kind of that convenience express versus that experiential. And, and certainly what this has meant during the pandemic is that those that have been focused on that convenience or that express or that you know easy to, to source aspect have been better positioned to win as dining rooms are shut down and the experience has taken a backseat to finding ways to easily and conveniently get food to consumers. And so that's certainly something we wanna explore with our panel as we get into it. 
I think another thing that we've seen shift during the pandemic is this idea of comfort foods. And so this was a survey we ran, uh, it was in, in June, but it was you know, right at the height of the pandemic. Uh, and we essentially asked them to agree or disagree with, with a bunch of statements. And the top statement that we saw was people are craving more comfort foods, right? So this whole idea of health and wellness, while I think it continues to be important to consumers, is also at least during the pandemic giving way to a little bit more of the indulgence or the comfort food type thing. Uh, you know, the other thing that I think is very important as consumers, we all wanna feel safe. Right? And so this idea of sanitization or of cleanliness or of making sure they feel safe going out to dine at restaurants or other food service establishments is very important. And then the other big thing I just mentioned from this is value items, right? And so comfort food value and I think safety are some of the big drivers right now in the food and beverage industry, certainly during the pandemic in terms of what we're seeing. And, and again, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And just uh, a couple numbers that I think are interesting. Technomic, we've been tracking the food service industry versus retail probably since the early 70s, I think, 1971, 1972. And so we've seen a, a shift in where consumers spend. So this is a timeline of total consumer spending on food at home or food service in the blue line versus food away from home. And so going all the way back to 1985, about 44 cents out of every dollar uh, spent on food and beverage were in food service. By 98, that was over 50%. Uh, we saw a recession in 2011 there, one of those inflection points. Um, and then by 2017, you see that it got up to about 52% of all spending on food and beverage was done in food service. And so food service, at least pre-pandemic, was actually larger than food retail in terms of consumer spending. Not necessarily occasions, but consumer spending. But I guess our fourth inflection point and, and really what we've seen happen during the pandemic, there's been a huge drop in consumer spending with food service dropping down to almost you know, 600 million versus uh, where we saw it last time and, and retail grocery picking up a big share, which you know this again is our, our fourth inflection point. And it'll be interesting to see how we emerge out of the industry, out of this pandemic uh, and how restaurants and food service recover at the potentially at the expense of, of retail, which obviously has seen a huge boon and a huge spike during the pandemic. So finally, one last point about the pandemic and then we'll get uh, turn it over to our, our panel. You as consumers probably see this in your own experience, but you know people have not totally abandoned food service. Uh, half of consumers are still looking to dine out and when they do, they want comfort and value, as I said, as well as hygiene. Consumers are bored and you probably get this. I know I'm bored sitting in my house day, you know, day after day. It's kind of groundhog day. Uh, and that, in at least in my mind and, and technomics mind, speaks to some pent up demand when things get back to normal. Um, and you know, a big shift in how people are eating, more off premise, drive through, takeout, delivery. Against you know, going to uh, some of those trends I talked about with convenience. So, with that brief talk through some top line trends, I want to I want to turn to our panel. Uh, they have a wealth of experience in food and beverage, and are going to talk through some of these issues in more detail and, and share some of their experience. And I'll just do a brief intro of each of them and let them talk more about themselves. And so uh, first up, uh, Anne Walgren. Um, oops, let me just get through this. I guess that was a build. Uh, Anne, could you uh, just uh, uh, do a brief introduction of yourself and, and talk about your experience? Sure, David, um, thanks. So I am a 91 alumni of the MBA program at, at UIC. So shout out to that. Um, I've got about 30 years experience in all in food and beverage, uh, actually, but with a real focus on strategy and innovation and um, a lot of global experience there as well. So I actually have recently joined uh, Beyond Meat. I had their strategy team there, which includes strategy planning, marketing, uh, innovation, and insight. So um, I actually recently spent about 16 years at McDonald's heading up strategy and innovation uh, for them as it relates to the food. So it's been, a, it's been a, a nice balance of perspectives in terms of working for a large global corporate you know, organization as well as you know, a startup, smaller kind of entrepreneurial uh, mindset. So happy to be here today, thanks. Great, thanks, Ann. Uh, next up is uh, PK Garg. PK, could you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your experience? Sure, um, uh, will do, David. Uh, hello, all. Um, I'm the drinks part of this seminar. Um, my background, I graduated from UIC in 1990 and has been in strategy consulting industry for about 25 years with A.T. Kearney and Bridge Strategy Group. 
Um, and about uh, five, six years ago, launched my own uh, venture. And um, um, actually, in the last couple of years, my partner um, and there are a lot of McDonald's colleagues here is the XX CEO of McDonald, uh, Don Thompson, who is my partner in this venture. Um, basically, when you look at alcohol or recreational alcohol, uh, we have to talk about recreational alcohol because recreational cannabis is also a thing now. Uh, when you look at recreational alcohol, there are four large categories. There's beer, wine, hard spirits, and then there are liqueurs and cordials. Uh, liqueurs and cordials are um, inspired from the regions they come from. So the number one selling liqueur, uh, which happens to be a cream liqueur as well, is Bailey's Irish Cream, inspired from Ireland, a country of about 5 million people. Uh, Kalua, Mexico, Amarula, South Africa, Jägermeister, Germany, Cointreau, France, Rambouille, Scotland, and so on and so forth. Uh, but there hasn't been any liqueur uh, representing one, one fifth of the world's population, which is the Indian subcontinent, and uh, which is known for tastes, aromas, and flavors for centuries. So Somras, which uh, literally means nectar of the gods, uh, is a company we launched in Chicago. Um, and it's the world's first line of Indian inspired liqueurs. And in a short amount of time, we have become uh, the world's most awarded line of cream liqueurs and, and, and the fastest growing uh, line of uh, Indian inspired liqueurs in the world. Um, and uh, recently we just launched Somers Coffee uh, that you see behind me. Um, uh, it's getting absolutely rave reviews. Um, and um, uh, you know, I'm happy to uh, chip in with any kinds of uh, drinks, uh, questions um, or, 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 or thoughts. Great, thanks, PK. And finally, uh, Manny Favela. Manny, could you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Certainly, thank you, Dave. Uh, yeah, this is, the, again, my name is Manny Favela and I, uh, uh, I'm a 1988 alumni from UIC. I uh, retired uh, from McDonald's in 2016 after a 26 year career as CFO for uh, McDonald's Latin America. Uh, after my retirement, uh, we started our own business, and now we own a uh, chain of uh, Mexican restaurants, as you can see on the picture, Burrito Parrilla Mexicana, of which we have uh, 10 locations. We opened a 10th location today, this morning. So uh, we have 10 locations, and uh, we, you know, that's kind of where I focused uh, most of my, uh, my time nowadays. Great. Thanks, Manny, and congratulations on the, uh, the new restaurant. Uh, so I am going to turn off my screen now and, uh, and essentially start the panel discussion. And so, um, again, you know, we invite all of you that are watching to ask questions of any of our panelists, uh, put them into the chats. We're going to leave a little bit of time toward the end where Karen can review them and, and ask, uh, ask any of the panelists, including myself, any questions. But uh, I'm going to start, I guess, with Anne and, and talk a little bit about health and wellness. And I referenced in the, in the presentation that at least during the pandemic, healthy eating perhaps has lessened a little bit in importance while consumers are perhaps looking for a little bit more comfort or indulgence. But you know, clearly health and wellness is still one of those, those big trends that we see impacting going forward. And how is the definition of healthy changing based on what you've seen? Does, does healthy mean something different than it did five or even three years ago? Yeah, that, it's, a, we, it's an interesting question. And I think for those of us in the food and beverage industry, we spend lots of time thinking about this. If we were to ask each and every one of you how you defined health and wellness, I think you would all have a different you know, definition of that. So, so I think health and wellness, it's, it's pretty multidimensional, um, therefore complex. And I think it's only becoming even more multidimensional. Um, so, so what I mean by that is, is health is something that's pretty personal and everyone really is on their own journey for how they define health and wellness. So it, everyone um, has their own level of involvement. And I also think it, it changes as you evolve through your life stages. So whether you're concerned about health and wellness as a, as a you know, young adult, whether you're concerned about it for your kids, your family, or you know, later in life. So, so I do think years and years ago, you know, say, say five years ago, a lot of the conversation was about calories, fat, sodium, um, and really kind of energy in and energy out. You know, from there it really evolved to, you know, consumers being really concerned about allergens, being concerned about um, ingredients and, and clean labels. Um, you know, and, and those things haven't gone away. I, I think that consumers really think of those things as almost green fees for a lot of the food that they consume. Um, and it's really evolved to the conversation being even more now about 
you know, um, calories for energy, right? Are you do, you, do you, do you eat and feel the way you want? So even if it's comfort food, right? Does it make you feel good? Does it give you that comfort? Does it make you feel lighter? Um, a lot of food conversations about prevention of disease and prevention of illness and the role that food plays in that. So not just not eating certain foods so that you prevent that, but eating certain foods to actually, you know, to have a more positive um, future when it comes to disease. The other interesting one that's really just starting to evolve is this health and wellness perspective for our broader community or our broader environment. So whether it be climate change, whether it be animal welfare, whether it be sustainability, and consumers thinking even more than just about their own personal health. So I do see an evolution um, of this. Again, I don't think we're moving away from how we previously defined health and wellness. I think we're kind of adding to it in certain things um, becomes green, become green fees. So I think the challenge for us in food and beverage, right, is it's personal. Um, everyone defines it differently, but yet we're challenged with meeting customers with where they're at. So I think it's important for those of us that work in food and beverage, right, to know what we stand for as a company. And because you can't be all things to all people, but determine what role you're going to play in health and wellness and then be the best at it and, and do it well. That's great. Thank you. Manny, uh, I guess building on, on the theme of health and wellness, you had mentioned in one of our discussions going into this that you've seen a movement toward more vegan and vegetarian options or demands, I guess, from, from your customer base. Can you elaborate maybe on what you're seeing there from a, from a vegan and vegetarian perspective at, at a restaurant level? Yes, yeah, certainly, David. Uh, <clears throat> you know, when we started our business eight years ago, um, obviously our focus is Mexican food, uh, authentic Mexican food. But we always offered uh, uh, veggie options, uh, you know, veggie burrito, veggie tacos, uh, et cetera. And over the years, we see a lot more and more requests uh, from our customers, one, to provide nutritional information, two, you know, allergen information as well. Um, but as time goes by, they continue to ask us for our recipes, not so much to replicate the recipes, but to understand what ingredients uh, go into each of our menu items. The customers are more and more sensitive to that. Uh, and then also, uh, we have been, you know, somewhat criticized by some of the uh, our vegan customers for using, for example, uh, chicken broth in our rice. You know, and then and the debate is why why ruin it, you know, with, with chicken broth? And I'm like, well, you know, we prepare the food based on what our customers demand and want. Uh, and their question is, well, why not? You know, if you can do the rice with the with the veggie broth. You know, and, and, and the customers are fine with the taste, would you do that? I said, certainly, you know, to the extent that we can accomplish both objectives, uh, we, will, uh, we will certainly entertain it. And we get those comments, you know, a, a couple of comments a month. And as time goes by, the frequency increases. Now we made a promise to our customers that we will find a solution and actually use veggie broth in our rice so they can enjoy that as well. And, uh, you know, now we're working in January, we're actually going to roll it out. Uh, but again, you have to be careful how you do this because the last thing you want to do is ruin the rice uh, and then have customers complain the other way. Uh, fortunately, we're not McDonald's, so I don't have to worry about changing the French fry. Uh, we're still relatively new, so we can, you know, we have a little more flexibility uh, to address the needs. But the vegan, we have quite a, quite a bit of vegan customers and they're very demanding and, you know, they, they continue to ask us to provide them uh, more options. Not only a few items, but entire, an entire dish. Um, so that they can, you know, they can also have variety uh, of products. Okay. Great. Thanks, Manny. PK is from a beverage perspective. I think part of the health and, and you know, wellness trend has been a shift in how people drink. Uh, we've seen a real move toward low or even no alcohol products. How have the competing demands of health and indulgence played out in the drinks business? Absolutely, David. Um, uh, drinks industry, global spirits industry, and I can speak to primarily spirits, uh, not necessarily wine and beer, is going through a huge shift right now. Uh, in fact, the number one company in the world, Diageo, uh, started something called a drink better movement about a couple of years ago. And uh, they were the first company in the world to launch a completely non-alcoholic distilled drink um, and it's called Seedlip, and it completely just surprised everybody. Um, and that started the no alcohol movement. Um, then it turned into a no and low alcohol movement. Uh, in Chicago, sometimes it's also called a sober curious movement. 
so health and wellness uh, relative to drinks, uh, first of all, ethyl alcohol uh, is not a healthy thing. It's toxic to your body. So uh, having said that, um, I think what you can do is um, keeping the concentration low of alcohol is the best possible scenario relative to health and wellness. And the new generation is actually moving towards a lot of uh, experiential drinking. And what I mean by that is uh, one day of the week, they might want to have a, a cocktail made out of a liqueur that let's say represents India, but the second day uh, they might have something Italian or something that takes them to a Greek islands and stuff like that. Uh, so people are moving away from, um, uh, how should I say, just the five after 5 p.m. drinking, which used to be 40% ABV and above, to almost like 5% ABV and above. So the number one trend right now in the spirits industry is uh, White Claw, you might have heard about it. It's only 5% alcohol. Um, and, and it's almost like a uh, happy hour can be a breakfast happy hour too. And, and that's where we come in with our spiked coffee. Uh, so that's sort of what's happening in the spirits industry. People are getting uh, moving towards taste, flavor, uh, low alcohol. Uh, obviously, if you really want to, you know, have um, a, a go at it, you can always add a couple shots of tequila to anything. Um, right. And um, uh, so that's what's been happening in the spirits industry. Okay. Great. Thanks, PK. Let's talk a little bit about convenience versus experience. And, and I mentioned in my presentation that, at least in, in my opinion or Technomics' opinion, the battle for the consumer, especially for the away from home uh, occasion, is largely sort of that competing uh, um, uh, sort of trend between quick, uh, quick convenient option or one that provides a unique experience. And so, Manny, you're a restaurateur. Convenience has been the driver for restaurant sales in 2020, clearly as dining rooms have been closed. And again, here now in, in Illinois and in other states, they're closing down again with the second wave. How have you pivoted your business and, and how do you think this plays out longer term? And I guess maybe just your thoughts on kind of that broader experiential piece versus convenience and how restaurants kind of manage both of those. Oh, I think you're on mute, Manny. Sorry. Uh, yeah, you know what they say, necessity is the mother of all inventions. Um, and it's, it's interesting how, uh, you know, what we used to take months or years to do, now all of a sudden you have the ability to do it in a day. Um, you know, when uh, COVID has definitely changed the, the restaurant landscape and fortunately or unfortunately for some, some of those changes I think are here to stay. Um, I was one of those people that... Uh, refused uh, third-party deliveries for a long time, primarily because I refused to outsource customer experience. And that was a big part of our business. A lot of our customers come because of the customer service they get from our restaurants. And I said, if I go the third-party route, you know, you're trusting somebody else to do that for you. But with COVID, all of a sudden, you know, everything was out the window because the, without third-party deliveries, uh, it is very challenging, uh, especially when the lobbies are closed. So. You know, we got on that uh, bandwagon and it has been a, a lifesaver. Uh, but also dry, those restaurants that had drive through obviously uh, were able to weather uh, this, uh, this uh, crisis much better off than everybody else did. So the restaurant landscape changed, the landscape changed dramatically. Uh, third party business now, or third party deliveries now represent about 25% of our business. Um, <clears throat> because dining rooms are closed, drive through is still the majority of it, but then carry out, it's another big portion. And our learning is that, you know, even when COVID is gone, third party deliveries are here to stay. Uh, the unit economics obviously continue with, you know, they need to continue to change and they will eventually become, um, I guess there will be a fair distribution of profits between the providers and the restaurants. Uh, but we have come to the realization that uh, that's gonna be part of our business going forward forever. Uh, curbside pickup did not exist before COVID. Now curbside pickup, customers have gotten used to it. They like going to restaurants. If you don't have drive through they are rather park in front of it and have somebody bring the food out to you. And I don't think that's gonna go away either, even if the COVID goes away. So this is the new reality of the restaurant business. Our challenge is, if we're gonna go this route, how do we protect customer experience? And what kind of packaging do we use so that the food, you know, can weather the transportation and the time gap between preparation and consumption um, and still deliver a decent product. How do you maintain the freshness? 
<clears throat> and how do you maintain the, uh, you know, the, the, the temperature as well as the, uh, uh, the quality of it. Uh, so I think the, the, the next discussion is exactly that, what kind of containers we use, what kind of packaging we use, how do you maintain it hot, and then how do you shorten the delivery period um, while you do this, uh, because that's going to be the, uh, the differentiator going forward. Most of the complaints now is exactly that, how, how cold or how, or how hot the food is, how fresh uh, or how, you know, or the presentation when they actually receive the product. Uh, and again, since this is here to stay, I think that's going to make it or break it for many restaurants. Interesting. Thanks. PK, in the drinks business, a big part of the value proposition, certainly in restaurants, is the experience. I mean, there's nothing better than getting a great cocktail or, uh, you know, talking to the bartender and that whole experience that you get when you just get a, a phenomenal drink uh, in, a, in a restaurant. How has the drinks business shifted during COVID to maintain or promote the value of the drink? And how do you think consumer expectations are changing relative to, um, to, to the overall drink and, and to the value of, of the drink? Uh, it's a wonderful question, David. Uh, I mean, drinks business is all about um, uh, being together with friends and family and ambiance and getting away from the usual and, and, and all of that. And unfortunately, that has been hit one of the hardest. And um, first of all, I'd like to, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to mention that we have been supporting um, an initiative with the uh, uh, charity called the uh, Children of Restaurant Employees, CORE. Uh, and we launched a small brand, Big Heart campaign, and we are looking to raise up to 125,000 uh, through that on uh, GoFundMe. So I wanted to uh, say that because they've been the hardest hit. Uh, restaurants, at least the drive-through has been uh, a savior. Uh, uh, in terms of booze, I mean, uh, really it, it, it was crazy for the first couple of months after COVID. And uh, then um, with our help, as well as some of the people in the industry, we started a cocktails to go movement and we got it approved by um, um, uh, the state of Illinois. Uh, so in Chicago right now, you can, go, you can do cocktails to go. And initially what restaurants started doing is they started selling bottles of the booze that they had, but you don't make money on that because uh, people buy cheaper booze uh, from uh, Benny's and stuff like that but they make money on cocktails. So uh, a big part of the country actually um, has approved the cocktails to go, uh, some forever. And uh, what that means is that um, uh, that's becoming a huge trend, like what uh, Manny was talking about in terms of to go. Um, and you would be surprised how, how good that could be. Um, and I, um, the other trend that is happening is um, uh, uh, drink boxes. Uh, example, just one example being saloon box, for example. So they take uh, smaller sizes of the liqueurs and put all the things together and send it to your home so you can make cocktails at home. Uh, so that's been greatly popular. The third trend uh, which is happening is Keurig for cocktails. And literally Keurig has a, a company called Drinkworks uh, that you can buy on Amazon and you can buy cocktail parts. So you can buy an old fashioned and, and, and um, and whatever you like, mojito and stuff like that. And then there's a company, uh, which is actually a sister company to us uh, with Don Thompson called Bartesian. Uh, that actually lets you invert bottles of booze into a machine and um, uh, it has pods as well and then lets you make different cocktails. So the world has changed quite a bit uh, for the spirits industry. Um, and um, there's a flight to quality um, if you notice, uh, spirits industry was uh, for, for a while into a lot of frivolous variety, right? I mean, you could see 50 flavors of X, Y, Z and all of that. People are moving towards um, authentic. Uh, for example, uh, one of our differentiators are we're the wor world's first line of cream liqueurs, which are all natural, gluten-free, no preservatives, um, and... Uh, those kinds of things. And so it's the next generation of cream liqueurs. So, so that's something what we talk about and, and uh, we are seeing a huge demand for our products globally actually, um, because people are tired of chemicals. People are tired of uh, you know, going in the health and wellness type of thing. And, and they just wanna, I mean, COVID is a, I call it a grand reset of 2020. Uh, everybody has started you know, seeing their family a lot more. Uh, loving their kids a little bit more, and, and also taking care of their health, like Anne was mentioning a little bit more. Great. Thanks, PK. And Anne, you're, you're sort of uniquely situated in that you work for a food or uh, you work for a food company right now, but you've got your restaurant experience. And 
So I guess, you know, kind of staying on this theme, but what, what's your reaction to the idea of how the food industry needs to address these differing consumer need states, right? So you've got this trade-off between convenience and experience and how, how do you see it uh, both from, you know, where you sit now and maybe, you know, looking back at, uh, you know, your, your career and, you know, what, how, how do you see this playing out? Yeah, it, it, it's interesting because I think whether you're in retail or you're in the restaurant side of the, the food and beverage industry, I think everyone's always been trying to figure out right that right balance between convenience and experience. I think COVID didn't change behaviors, they just expedited behaviors, if you think about it. So, so many of the things that we're talking about that consumers are doing more of, they were already doing, they're either just doing more often or more people are behaving in that way. So, so that's what's interesting. And those companies that had kind of a head start in that space seem to be doing well. So some of the things that I've seen, you know, be, be successful on, on both sides, right? Whether it be retail or consumer packaged goods, you know, at retail, there was already a lot of home meal kits, right? People wanting to eat at home, but there, there, there's more of that than ever before. So again, it's not necessarily a new trend or a new idea, but it is, it's expedited, you know, um, pretty dramatically. Same with, with pack size, you know, even, even at beyond something as simple as if you sold a burger in a two pack or a four pack, we now have 10 packs. We didn't have that, you know, before COVID, but consumers were purchasing more at retail, eating more at home. And so, and, and then, you know, you layer on that experiential component by saying that it's a cookout pack, you know, that's, um, which, which, you know, has a little bit of a play on how you're going to use it at home. Um, you know, mobile and delivery, we were already down that path, but my gosh, the usage of that has just skyrocketed um, through COVID. And then others have talked on a few others, but some of my favorites, right? Family meal bundles, they were here. I, I know I'm using those uh, a lot more. And then of course my favorite, the cocktails to go. It's no longer just a bottle of wine, right? But be able, being able to take that experience that you used to have in that restaurant and just recreate it at home. I think the more organizations can make that more convenient. So whether it be the retailer or the restaurant company make that more convenient for us to recreate that experience at home. Um, I think it's a win, but, but we've constantly been trying to figure out that balance, right? And, and I think every, you know, I think so many places are rising to that occasion right now. Great. Uh, let's talk a little bit about sustainability. And, and as I talked about it at the, at the beginning of, of the session, you know, I, I kind of look at it as practices that involve not only products, but people and the planet as well. And I think we've heard some of that even uh, already. Uh, PK, this, this has certainly come through in, the, in, mm -hmm. in drinks, especially in packaging. Um, but how are, how are drinks companies addressing sustainability? Well, the, the first thing is, um, um, is actually before COVID um, uh, is uh, straws, um, getting away from plastic straws. I mean, that was a huge movement that started in the drinks industries and is continuing. And, um, uh, you know, it really does a lot uh, to save the oceans from, from plastic, right? So any um, uh, high quality restaurants or even uh, in general uh, restaurants are now seeing either reusable steel straws or uh, wooden straws or paper straws and stuff like that. So that has the most impact as far as the drinks industry is concerned um, uh, on that. But uh, beyond that, um, there are a lot of companies now who are directly addressing the packaging as well. So. Uh, Bacardi recently launched a biodegradable bottle, um, and uh, um, and uh, there are a lot of other companies who are experimenting with biodegradable bottles or uh, things that don't pollute our environment from a from a uh, uh, you know uh, plastic and, and 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 stuff like that. Uh, so that's a huge um, movement in the drinks industry as well, uh, David. Okay. And Manny and, and PK just referenced straws and you had been talking earlier about how packaging is such a big issue now for that to go experience within the restaurant. Um, you know, straws, things like foam certainly falling out of favor. How, how is the restaurant industry reacting and, you know, what does uh, the future look like in terms of packaging at restaurants? Yeah, you know, this is an interesting one, especially with uh, the reality of COVID. I think, uh, you know, the, there is an intention to move towards less plastics and styrofoam. Um, and the customers are demanding it more and more over time as well. You know, when you, when you use styrofoam to, to, to provide something, the customers will immediately react to it. Um, so you have to move in that direction. I think the challenge right now with COVID is that, and I just mentioned how important the packaging is. Unfortunately, 
the sustainable packaging, it doesn't hold as well as this, what we have been using for all these years. So temporarily, I think this is, a, this is going in the negative direction. Uh, and hopefully after COVID, it'll, it'll, go, it'll go the other way. Uh, but definitely, I think, uh, you know, we have stayed away from styrofoam. We still use a lot of plastics uh, and customers do complain. And I think we have to find a way to move in a different direction. The biggest barrier in the restaurant industry, though, is cost. That still sustainable packaging is significantly more expensive <clears throat> than all the other alternatives and not necessarily providing, uh, you know, better holding uh, of the product. So I think as, as, as the sustainable options become more and more competitive, uh, that will also become uh, inevitable. And I think the customers will reward you for it. But how much of that, how much of that can you pass on to the pricing, you know, in, in, in a period where restaurants are really struggling and that balance is what makes it difficult. Yeah. And, and Anne, uh, you know, I, I, I said in my presentation and I do think with, you know, companies like yours, you know, currently that, a lot of the plant-based proteins are winning, not only on health and wellness, but on that sustainability message. And what's what's your sense on, I guess, the plant-based phenomenon, how it's driven by sustainability demands? How do you how do you view that particular part of uh, you know kind of the growth in, in plant-based? Yeah, it's it, it's interesting because there's a there's a lot of ways into plant-based. So there's a lot of reasons consumers go to plant-based. Um, First and foremost, it's for health and wellness reasons. So, you know, despite all the sustainability benefits, um, health and wellness is still number one, which I know we talked about. And there's a lot of different reasons businesses get into, you know, plant-based as well. I got to tell you my own journey there started many years ago and long before I joined Beyond. And it was really just having an understanding of what the future of food looks like. So if, if you stop and think about where we're currently at in our food production system. So there's, there's an, you know, depending on what source you, you look at, the numbers change a little bit, but essentially we're expecting a $3 billion, $3 billion person increase in population between now and 2050, right? So if we continue to produce food the way we are, we're gonna have a huge gap in our food supply. So, right, so, so the population is increasing. As incomes increase, people are consuming more animal-based products because they have more income and more money to spend on that. So we're gonna have about a 50% shortfall if we continue to produce the same way, if we wanna feed the world's population by 2050. And then, so in order to meet that shortfall, we're gonna need almost a half a billion increase in acres of land to produce that food. So that, that's bigger than India. So if you think about the land that's going to be needed to do that, at the same time, we're thinking about greenhouse gases in our environment, and we need to reduce greenhouse gases in order to protect and sustain the climate and the environment in which we live. So the way in which we're looking at food today, it's just not a sustainable proposition in terms of how we make our food. So, so to me, when I think about plant-based, I don't know what plant-based will look like in 30 years, but what I do know is we have to think really differently about where we get our food, how we produce our food so that we can feed the world's population. So I don't think of it necessarily as a trend. I don't think of it as a phenomena. I think about it as being here to stay. And it's kind of up to all of us in this industry to figure out how we kind of meet that increased demand given the increase in population, given the rise in income, and given the need you know, to feed the world's population, not just today, but you know, 30 years down the road. Thanks. Um, I, I guess just, and I know we want to leave a little bit of time for uh, questions from the audience. I guess, uh, PK, just, just very, very briefly, how do you see the drinks business emerging from the pandemic? I mean, what, you know, if you put on your, you look into your crystal ball and you say, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, but let's say five years from now, what looks different uh, versus today? I mean, how does, how does the drink side of the business change? Well, uh, uh, two things. Uh, first of all, um, uh, actually the drinks business and especially off premise uh, for people like us who sell products uh, in retailers has substantially increased, right? And, and uh, it's been a coping mechanism for a lot of us. Um, uh, in, you, know, uh, you know, in the early part of the pandemic, a lot of like the drink sales went up quite a bit. Um, you know, we are year over year substantially higher than last year. Uh, and um, we attribute that to just that people are uh, spending a lot more time and they're drinking a little bit more than they used to. So that's been happening. Um, uh, in that process, uh, actually, if you curve the plot 
when the pandemic started, people were going initially to uh, the Tito vodka, the 1.75 liter uh, bottles of clear liquid or brown liquid or whatever liquid you drink. Uh, and then they got tired of it. Then they are like, oh my God, I'm, 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 I'm not doing well with my health. Then they started getting into uh, the cocktails to go movement um, and started discovering uh, products. Like I was mentioning, they're more experiential, that they like to uh, experience different parts of the world. So that's been a biggest trend. Um, it has created a flight to quality. So for example, there used to be brands, I won't take any names, but they used to have shimmering liquids in them um, and all kinds of things that were sold. I mean, nobody wants those anymore. People want clean stuff, as clean as it can be. So that's, that's the number one trend. Um, and the number two trend is everybody has become a home bartender. And that's a huge thing. Um, it's really, I mean, uh, the uh, whole industry has spawned off of that. A lot of the old mixologists and bartenders are now doing Zoom classes on teaching people how to mix. So I was not one of the guys who, who was into mixing my own drinks and whatnot. Just go to a restaurant and stuff like that. But now, um, once you get used to it, and once you start figuring it out, the basic proportions of different kinds of drinks, um, uh, you know, taking base drinks and adding flavors and all that kind of stuff. So that's a huge, a huge trend. Um, and um, especially the younger next generation of people, uh, they were um, uh, tired of too much alcohol anyways. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why beer was, has been declining. Uh, so they are really embracing that. Uh, so I think in coming years, it's going to be more flight to quality. Um, and uh, home mixing, ho home drinking, I mean, bartending, sorry. Okay. And, and Manny, just, just briefly, I guess I spent a lot of time thinking about this as well, sort of the future of the restaurant industry. I mean, you know, how do you, you talked a little bit about, you know, off-premise and takeout and delivery being here to stay. Any other sort of big, big things that you see coming, you know, five years from now that, uh, you know, may make the restaurant industry look different than it is today? Yeah, I, I think we need to keep an open mind because the, uh, the, the, the landscape is changing very rapidly and nobody really knows what the future looks like. <laughs> There's a lot of talk about ghost kitchens. You know, I don't know what role that's going to play. <clears throat> I mentioned the drive through curbside delivery, uh, or, you know, they're still going to be relevant going forward. Uh, and obviously the key component here is the use of technology. How do we effectively use technology to use all these different vehicles, all these different uh, distribution vehicles? Um, and I don't know the answer to that. All I can tell you is we will find a way to do it better than anybody else. Uh, you know, the, to make sure that the, that the food is fresher and that the food tastes better than everyone else. And that's at the end of the day, how you do it, it doesn't really matter. That's what the customer wants. Yeah. And, and any, any last thoughts on you know, maybe from a food manufacturer, from a food supplier perspective, how, how do they need to adjust to this new normal and, you know, how, uh, how, you know, food and beverage companies should be approaching this? Yeah, I think on the topic of health, I, I do think that that definition is going to continue to evolve and what aspects of that are important to consumers. I think sustainability, animal welfare will just continue to be as important, right? So this health and wellness of the community and the environment which you live in. You know, one of the things that we didn't touch on, but but currently 70% of consumers around the world are either reducing their meat consumption or don't consume meat at all. So that's an interesting fact to think about too. So what, what are the proteins that are kind of filling that void if in fact consumers are having less animal protein? So I think health and wellness will continue to evolve. I do think a lot of these experiential components and my other two you know, partners here mentioned on that, a lot of the experiential components that really got you know, dialed up in COVID, I think are really, um, here to stay. So, you know, I think it's for those that haven't caught up to that. I think it's continuing, you know, to do that and then anticipating what next really, you know, I know it, when I spent my time at McDonald's, we were always thinking about what's the new definition of convenience because right consumers are, are moving pretty fast and the more convenient you give them, the more they want. Yeah, for sure. Great. Well, I know, uh, Karen, we've got about seven minutes left. Uh, I'm, I guess, going to turn it back over to you, see if there's any audience questions. Certainly, you know, for all of you that are watching, uh, use the chat function. Feel free to reach out, uh, you know, to any of us or ask questions. And, and Karen, I guess I'll turn it back over to you to see uh, what the audience has to, has to ask. Wonderful. Well, thank you to all of you. It's interesting. We had a, I had a few questions come to me that then you answered. So it was like you had perfect uh, sense of what people were thinking. Um, I do have a question, and I, I think it's really for all of you. Um, 
And the question came in beforehand, which is what advice would you give to someone starting out? Specifically, this person says they are a partner in a new restaurant venture in New Buffalo, Michigan. But if you were starting in this adventure, given that it's 2020, almost 2021, what advice might you give to someone? And maybe Anne, if I could just start with you. And Yeah, I'll jump in. You know, quick advice would be learn all aspects of the business and learn how to manage and run the PL, right? Because at the end of the day, it's about understanding your consumers and making money doing it. So giving them what they need, but, you know, making some money doing it. So I think you know, being that general manager and being able to understand all aspects of the business before you actually pick where you want to go deep, I think is really key. Wonderful. Manny, any advice? I would just say, keep an open mind again. <clears throat> um, and don't, <clears throat> don't just go ahead and do the restaurant the old way because that's not going to work anymore. So have an open mind about delivery because that's not going to go away. Have an open mind about curbside um, and keep, you know, stop insisting that every customer has to come into your restaurant because again, there will be a component to that, but that alone might not be sufficient to make the restaurant work. Thank you. PK, any advice? Yeah, well, first of all, use your UIC MBA, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> use all the different functions because you're gonna be running into everything. Um, and if you're starting out, I mean, my main thing, I mean, I started out literally um, uh, as an entrepreneurial venture is uh, reach out to people reach out to your network, reach out to alumni, to, to your friend circle who have done it before. Um, it is a lot easier uh, to uh, get the information right and do it right the first time. And uh, the biggest thing when you're starting out is the, uh, the shortage of money or cash. Uh, so that's why you really have to reach out um, and uh, just uh, absorb from them. So if you're thinking of a restaurant and call somebody like Manny and, and you know, uh, please, can I, have a coffee with you and and what are the top five things that uh keep you from sleep uh in the night manny and and that, that those kind of conversation open ended conversations uh so that'll be my biggest advice and just for the record we didn't we didn't pay pk at all to say to use your alumni <laughs> network and, and to reach out and use a, a degree from uic but thank you for saying that well I, i'm part of it so <laughs> Uh, Dave, any, any advice you'd like to add? And, and well, no, I mean, I, I think they've sort of covered it, right? I mean, networking, keeping an open mind. I think, you know, when I when I was at UIC, I thought I was going to be uh, in the world of high finance. And it turns out I'm, you know, doing restaurant and food service uh, research and consulting. And so you never know where your career is going to go. And I think, you know, just, you know, looking at the opportunities that are available to you and never closing off any of those avenues, I think is, is just important for anyone starting out to not necessarily have a set idea of what their career should look like, but, you know, keep an open mind to the opportunities that, that appear to them. Thank you. And we had sort of a, a question that came in addition to that question, which is what advice would you give to a small independent business in a community neighborhood, especially this person's ethnic small business. So anything specific that you might recommend? Uh, well, you know, I'll, I'll take a crack at it, I guess, because uh, I I feel the same way in many ways. I think the most important thing is invest in that community, get the community engaged. Uh, we have gotten significant feedback from that. When when you get when the customers come in, they become part of your business on a regular basis, and then all of a sudden they have a school event. You know, they come to your restaurant, you support them. Uh, and it becomes a family environment. They're thankful, you're thankful, and I think everybody helps each other out. Uh, when you have that connection with a community, the face of the business changes. Uh, how people perceive your business changes dramatically. So if you're not investing in a community where, you're, where your customers are at, uh, I think you're missing a huge opportunity. Excellent advice. Any, any want to add on to that at all? Okay. Um, great. Well, thank you again to all of our panelists and thank you to everybody for, for joining us today. It's really been such an interesting conversation and appreciate you sharing all of your thoughts and expertise. Um, I just want to wrap up by thanking all of you for joining us for our UIC Alumni Exchange Series this past year. We are grateful to all of our speakers, including, of course, our panelists today that have helped us bring a diverse programming to UIC alumni and friends. We will be off the month of December, but have a great lineup for you starting the new year. In January alone, we will have experts discuss intermittent fasting, social and emotional well being of children during turbulent times, and what does defunding the police and schools mean? To find a recording of this episode or any of our past episodes, um, and to find out more information about upcoming programs and to register, 
please do visit go.uic.edu backslash alumni exchange. And of course, please be on the lookout for that brief survey that I mentioned at the beginning. Thank you again to all four of our UEC alumni panelists. We're very proud that you are graduates and very much appreciate all of your time in this conversation today. Thank you to all of you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you next time at the UIC Alumni Exchange. Thanks again and have a great day. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you all.